uh, one year stint at uh, ATR and one year at, at Google. Um, we were talking today in the meeting and I found out that Greg is uh, also the director of the School of Computing Science. And I said, Greg, congratulations. And he said, I've been director for three years now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, he's overseeing kind of the whole computing department. Um, there's a lot of challenges to that, but I think he's been really productive um, you know, all throughout his career. So we're really glad to have you. And thank you so much for coming. Let's welcome Greg. <laughs> Thanks very much, and uh, thanks, for, thanks for setting this up. I, I always say yes to things that get myself into trouble, so I became department chair. Uh, condolences, not congratulations, is usually what people would say, but seriously, it's fun. Uh, this may be my last trip, but we have to get back. It's faculty hiring season, and I uh, need to get, get back to that. So anyway, very happy to, to be here to tell you about some of our work on activity recognition. Um, the sort of, there's a main part to this talk, and then I've also thrown in an appendix, something that's sort of a bit unrelated that I wanted to just uh, talk with you about um, while I'm here a bit on uh, visual question answering uh, VQA at the end. Okay, so for the, the, main, the main part of the talk, I'm going to be uh, discussing our work on activity recognition to, so to set the stage for, for what we're, we're doing. Um, we'd like to be able to take in scenes such as this one, you know, either an image or a video, and try to understand what's happening here. And in terms of the, the ingredients that go into sort of solving this activity recognition task, there are a number of things we need to do. Um, one of them, we, we probably would like to know whether or not there are people and, and where are they. And, and these days, you know, the state of the art in algorithms like this has progressed to the point where I, I wouldn't say this is a solved problem, but we're definitely at the point on precision recall where we can almost, you know, 100%, maybe it's 98% precision recall equal error rates of detecting all of the people in this scene. But of course, you know, we want to go beyond that and we want to understand what's happening. So one of the things we, we might need to do is detect where are these people. So, so knowing that they are in a long-term care facility in a nursing home, that sort of context, knowing that there's a, a walker over here and that there's a chair, this helps me understand what's going on. So those people that I detected before, I'd also like to know individually what actions are they doing. So the problem of action recognition might be to put labels on these people, such as that one is standing, that one is running, that one has fallen. So I'd like to be able to do that as well. Beyond that, there, there are other types of things. I could ask, you know, why is that person running? Well, she's running to go get help for the person who has fallen. Why is she squatting? She's squatting to comfort the person who has fallen down. So this sort of intention or social role, that's something else that we've worked on in, in our previous work, trying to figure out why are the people doing the actions they are. And then at a, at a sort of holistic level, what's going on in this scene, uh, we often call this group activity recognition, what is the overall situation? So these are a set of people who are trying to help a fallen person. So all of these, all of these ingredients, all these different things that I want to solve, um, they're all interrelated, right? So I'd like to go um, tag what objects are in the scene, where are the people, what are they doing, what group activity are they engaged in, what sort of individual um, um, people are doing, all of that is related together. Okay, and so that's why I'm going to sort of talk today about structured models for understanding images and videos and how we can use those for activity recognition. The different dimensions upon which I'm going to, to look at this sort of notion of structure, there are going to be three sort of main parts to this talk. In the first part, I'm going to talk about some of our work on label structure, where we're going to talk about interrelations between different objects or tags that I can put on a scene. So I'm going to talk about structure in the sense of labels. In the middle part of this talk, I'm going to talk about some things on temporal structure. So this is some joint work with Serena Yun. I think actually came through here a little while ago. I'll talk a little bit about our work on modeling temporal structures. And then finally at the end I'll talk about modeling group structures and interactions between people. So some recent work that we've done on analyzing how groups of people interact together. Okay, so on to the first part, talking about label structure. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time, especially they're kind of these disconnected components. And so if you have questions on one part of it, I'd be happy to take those while we're doing that, that particular part. Okay, so to answer motivate what we're talking about with label structure, Here's an input image over there on the left-hand side. And on the right, here is a partial set of labels that I could potentially put on this image. Um, you can think of each of these as sort of Boolean things, yes or no. Is this an indoor scene, yes or no? Is it an outdoor man-made scene, yes or no? Is it a sports field, yes or no? Is there a trench, yes or no? Is there a batter's box, yes or no? Okay, so I've got all these labels that I could potentially put on, on this scene. 
So pick one of these and you know, maybe batter's box. And you know, I think many of you are computer vision people. And so if you ask, you know, where in this image is the visual evidence for there being a batter's box in this scene, what would you say? The, yeah, the, the batter. Okay, the batter, the, the swinging, the sports field. Probably you don't go and point at this smudge of white pixels that's over there. Right, that, that is important. At some point, you probably need to actually check that, yes, there is actually a batter's box, and this isn't somebody, I'm not sure, standing in a different environment, swinging a baseball bat, or this is sort of, you know, someone warming up, not in the, the sort of, you know, at-home plate. So you probably need to go to verify that. But obviously, there, there are relationships between these labels, okay? And it's not the case that one would sort of just sit down and say, batter's box based on this smudge of pixels. You analyze this scene, and you can, you, they're core relations between these labels, right? And so, so I'm just sort of highlighting some things that are likely present here that, you know, things such as baseballs and batter's boxes likely go together. Things such as trenches and sports fields are unlikely to go together. All right, so there's some, there's some information that's contained in this that I sort of have relationships between the labels. There's structure there. And so certain scenes and certain objects are likely to go well together, okay? So what we'd like to do is we'd like to build a, a, a model that's able to incorporate those sorts of relationships between labels and infer them from the image content that I'm provided. Okay. So your, sort of your standard approach could be I could take this image and put it through some sort of visual architecture. So you know, convolutional neural, neural network that would go and try to predict which of those many labels is present are present in this, this image and which are not. Okay. And so beyond that, though, again, I would like to be able to model these correlations and, and relationships between them. So not just taking this visual architecture, which will be used to produce what we'll call initial activations, which will be corresponding to how much I think each of those labels is present in the image or not. What I'd like to do is I'd like to refine those. I'd like to do some sort of inference that operates over top of that knowledge graph, the sort of the set of labels and the relationships between them that can help me refine those initial estimates for which things are present or not in the scene to get me better estimates for which tags I should put on this system. And what I'm going to describe to you is sort of an end-to-end -end trainable system that can do both of these things. So we can sort of have a visual architecture that will detect labels in the image. Then I can also do this sort of inference over top of those initial activations to get refined labels. And beyond this, I could use it not only with just an input image, but if I have access to metadata, right? If I have something like a GPS tag that tells me where this image has been taken, or if I have something about the user who uploaded this photo to a, um, a social media site, I could use that as well to help me get better estimates for my initial activations, and again, run this inference to improve quality of estimates for different labels. Okay, so I'm going to go into detail now and describe what this, this inference process is going to look like and how I'm going to, to build this. Okay, so I'll start off by describing it in doing sort of inference in a top-down fashion. Right? So by this I mean labels that exist at a sort of coarser or higher level of the hierarchy. Things like, is this an indoor or outdoor scene? Is it a man-made scene? Is it not? Working my way down to, is this a sports field? Is there a trench? Is there a baseball? Is there a bat in the scene? The picture over here is meant to denote each of these is sort of one of those binary, in this case, labels that's in my, my, my graph of, of different concepts I know about. What I'll do is I'll take my, my input image and I'll put it through this visual architecture to get initial estimates for which of these things are present in the scene. So I'm going to denote those by sort of little x ti, which is going to mean sort of my initial activation for how much I think some concept is present at some layer in this graph structure I have to represent context. And that's going to be based on a CNN that operates over the input image. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to refine those estimates based upon um, other concepts that are related to this working in a top-down fashion. So what I'll be doing is producing a new refined sort of better estimate, we hope, of that concept A, how much do I believe this is now present in the scene, based upon other concepts that are either in the same layer as this current concept that I'm working on. So I can look at other items, other labels that are present at the same level of the hierarchy as me, and I can have some weights that can basically say, how much do I think that there's going to be a trench in this scene based upon other concepts that are present in the scene at the same level of this hierarchy? Okay, so is there a trench here? Does that go with a pitcher's mound? Does that go with a batter's box, etc.? There'll be a set of weights H, which will control how much do I reinforce those different concepts at the same level of this knowledge graph. Right? 
I will also, again, as I was saying, pass message from the top down. So based on refined estimates for different concepts at a higher level in the hierarchy, I will again have a set of weights which will control how much should those reinforce a concept at a slightly lower level of the hierarchy. Right? So the, these H's and V's, they're going to be trainable weights, and I'll be able to train all of these using backpropagation, basically training both the visual architecture that can produce the initial activations X, as well as weights that'll control how much do I reinforce different concepts at the same level of the hierarchy, or ones that are from the top down. Right? And so, really, the way I view this is sort of it's very much akin to belief propagation or message passing in a probabilistic graphical model except that what we're doing is we are learning basically the potential functions, to use that sort of terminology, the H's and the V's are basically saying how much of these concepts reinforce each other, what's the sort of you know, compatibility of having different concepts at the same level of the hierarchy present together, or ones up above presence with the ones down below. Okay, so of course there's no reason why we just have to run this process top down, we can also run it bottom up. All right, so in the same way that I can have weights that say how much should I have concepts at the same level of the hierarchy reinforcing each other, how much the ones from the, the layer up above enforcing the ones down below, I could do the same thing in a top-down manner and a bottom-up manner. All right, and so I can sort of repeat those, those equations, doing a top-down inference stage and a bottom-up inference stage, where I'll use little arrows to denote the parameters and the refined estimates that come from running this procedure top-down. Same thing running bottom up. And then I can introduce extra things that can basically combine those two results. So how much do I trust the top down inference procedure? How much do I trust the bottom up inference procedure? I can have weights U that trade those two things off. Right? And so again, all of those things I can, I can learn with backpropagation. I can figure out how much I should trust each of these different procedures. Okay, so that's sort of the the bidirectional method. Um, I can also incorporate prior information into this if I wish. So if there are certain connections that I believe should either you know, not exist together, should exist together, should be positive correlations, should be negative correlations, I can do that by enforcing some structure to those ma matrices V plus and V minus that basically control how much concepts reinforce each other or not. So I can have some structure to those that, for example, has zeros where I don't want any correlation or I can have positive values only in these, these matrices and make sure that these will enforce sort of positivity and negativity in how I um, construct things. So in terms of the details of, of how that would work, I could split up my, again, my message passing into sort of positive correlations only, negative correlations only, and you know, the technical details are basically if we use ReLUs for the sort of interaction terms and enforce positivity on those parameters, then I can make sure that I have only positive or negative correlations where I want. Okay, so this type of model can basically then be used to do this refinement of probabilities. I can enforce structure to it. I can incorporate prior information about which labels should be used together or not. Um, you could generalize this to have you know, exclusivity relationships or inclusivity relationships as well. Okay, so, so to recap, so this is what the, the full model um, looks like. We take in an image, we use a CNN, produce some initial visual activations, we run this inference procedure top down and bottom up, combine the results together to get refined probabilities for each of the, the concepts that I wish, and then I can use those to produce tags on, on vi images. Right, and again, just to reiterate, I could do that as well via some partial information that I'm provided via metadata. So if I have something, like someone tells me this is an outdoor man-made scene, I could put that through a logit to get a sort of softened probability for that thing being present, and again, feed that into the same procedure. Okay, so I could sort of condition on some extra outside information as well. Okay, so we've, um, we've run this model on a variety of different data sets, both for um, images, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our work on video analysis as well. Um, there's some, some standard data sets in this, this world. You know, there are things like the NUS wide data set that are collected from Flickr. You've got a bunch of images that have um, tags at multiple levels of detail, as well as some uh, sort of group, groups of users who've uploaded things together, so there's sort of metadata about the users. We've used both of those as sort of um, you know, external information that we can refine with. Um, there's also the older Sun 397 data set that has a particular label structure to it. We've done experiments on, on all of these. 
So I, I have a, a bunch of slides and sort of running through, you know, the usual sort of thing. We do some ablation studies. We take out bits and pieces of the model. Um, these are sort of looking at mean APs, MAPs over um, the different data sets. The, the baseline that, that probably matters the most is sort of doing a CNN with independent logistics for each of these tags, right? So you could say, well, does this inference procedure matter? Why do you need to do this? Can't you just train up a CNN and have it predict each of these tags independently? Doesn't it capture enough information in its previous layers to do this sort of thing? Um, this model does outperform that. So the, the red bars are sort of the combined model. We're getting a boost in, in MAP across all of these data sets by modeling this interaction term the way that we do it. All right, so qualitatively, um, here's some examples of, of what it produces. Um, these are the test images up top, the ground truth labels um, in blue here, the CNN plus independent logistics for each of these um, concepts. That's what it will produce, and then our predictions are sort of these refined estimates. And again, you're sort of, well, you're still looking at these tasks, you know, the ground truth is far from perfect. You know, this first image is a good example. Um, the ground truth tag in singular is railroad um, only. Um, our method produces railroad person and sky and person is an incorrect uh, label. So it sort of produces reasonable sort of things and is able to clean up some of the, the uh, results they have. Um, we've also you know, done things comparing to other state-of-the-art methods. Um, these results are on NUS wide. Again, um, the red method is, is R1. We do things where we use you know, group, group memberships from the Flickr users as side information to try to um, predict what the tag should be on the, the image. And again, we get MAP results that are, are quite, quite good. Um, same thing with sort of Sun 397. These are some more examples where in this case, we're assuming that someone gives us the top level category label, such as is this an outdoor man-made scene? Is it an outdoor natural scene? Is it an indoor scene? But we assume that we have metadata that provides that. And then based on that, we can infer the rest of the tags that should go on this image, right? And so again, the ground truth labels and our predictions are, are shown here. Okay. so. Recently, we've also um, applied this to the YouTube 8M data set, so doing video tagging. I'm, I'm not sure how many people here work on, on this data set before. It's probably, probably the best in terms of the diversity of videos and the, the, this li large set of labels that are possible. Um, the data set comes in sort of two flavors. There are about 8 million YouTube videos with 4,800 possible labels. So there's a very rich set of structure in here. And sort of everything from you know, Lady Gaga videos to cat with head and toaster sort of things. All right, and the sort of representation we use is, I, I guess, kind of naive in a way, but it's pretty effective, is basically just to do mean pooling over a CNN architecture on a per frame basis. And so people who work on action recognition, it's always a bit disappointing that, that these sort of things work. Um, I always think that like, YouTube videos are weird. They don't necessarily have much temporal structure to these categories. I mean, I think if you're trying to find cat with head in toaster, you just need to see one frame like this. Like, that's enough. Once you see that, you know that it's okay. A mean pooling type of approach tends to get that type of representation quickly. Okay, so we sort of do per frame CNN, um, mean pool those feature vectors, end up with a representation that you then put into our architecture for doing message passing, and we sort of build a structure over the different labels that uses some sort of top level vertical sort of category labels, and then the more horizontal labels that are cross category, we do inference up and down over that, that type of machine. So, so the results basically, we compare to a bunch of different um, baseline methods. I was mentioning there's not very much temporal structure in these videos. Um, recurrent neural networks like LSTMs tend not to do particularly well um, compared to just putting through things through CNNs. So there are a couple of baseline methods. Um, on the left, those are mean APs, so 26.6 mean AP for an LSTM-based method and 28.1 for a logistic regression one. Um, we have methods, you know, using our, our inference that can basically give you, you know, three, four points improvement in MAP by doing that message passing up and down. Um, there are two different versions of the data set with uh, different results. Um, I'd also just quickly mention GAP. Um, GAP is geometric mean average precision. And it's sort of, it's a good idea if you're, you're working with data sets like this where you have 4,800 different labels with very different um, uh, statistics in terms of how frequent they are. Uh, using GAP instead of MAP is a little bit more robust to s infrequent categories kind of dominating your MAP measurements. Um, but in, in both metrics, using this inference procedure helps to improve, improve performance. All right, so, so that's sort of the, the, the first part of the talk. Sort of summary of this, we've done this work on um, 
inference and structured label space. And what I like about this is you're basically able to build up models that can take in side information, can take in partial observations, do reasoning over which labels should be present together or not. And we can do all of that in a, in a deep network that's end-to-end -end trainable. So any, any questions about this part before I jump ahead on to the others? Okay, yeah. Hey. So just to make sure, yeah. like your alphas are just uh, the 1,000 plus labels from uh, imaging the, the, the concept, we will call it the concept layer. Uh, no, so for, for the different data sets, the final um, uh, possible, the A's, the outputs, the those are the labels. Those are the, the tags. So we need a, we basically have a, each A here is a score for how much I think that concept is present in the image. I see. And can you also keep track of the spatial location? How, like, no. uh, this is uh, probable if the other concept is bottom right, for example? Yeah, right now there's, yeah, right now there's no spatial component to this, these models. We've only used them in a um, whole image tagging or whole video tagging. And, and absolutely, you could do something, I think, um, you know, other people have done things on doing spatial relationships between models. I think that it, it would be really interesting to extend this type of work to have a, a spatial component. You could have parameters which could, could, can control relative positions and orderings, you know, contextual object recognition. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. So you, we've tried. We've tried doing it in the same way you might do belief propagation a few times. We have tried this as well. So you can do uh, a few different iterations of this message passing procedure, where you could run, you know, three iterations of this passing. What, what ends up happening? It's kind of there are a lot of technical details, but vanishing gradients become a problem when you start trying to train those types of things, right? And so you, you have to be careful about this interplay between convergence and you know, basically things going to zero when you don't want them to, and that's, that's something we're, we're looking at right now. So in, in, this, in this line of work, we usually did a top-down pass and a bottom-up pass. Um, we have some other papers that also learn um, gating functions. So you can also um, uh, do this type of uh, deciding what graph connections there should be at runtime via gating functions that can turn things on or off. And in, in that work, we did iterate a few stages of this message passing, but yeah, vanishing gradients can become a problem. Any other questions? Okay, so, all right. So, so that was sort of the, the, the first part of the talk on sort of, um, you know, whole image level labeling, modeling structures in, in these labels, or whole video level labelings and structures. So the, in the second part of the, the talk, I want to, to go into some things on temporal structure. And here we'll use sort of action detection as a way to sort of motivate what we're doing. So given an input video like the one on the left, instead of just tagging it and saying there is running or there is talking in this video, instead I'd like to give some temporal extent to those. So I'd like to say that these frames, these moments in time, corresponded to a running action, these moments in time corresponding to a, a talking action. And so this problem of sort of action detection is actually going to label in time when this happens. And again, we've, we've done work on spatio-temporal, so you can also extend this to both doing not just temporal reasoning, but also spatio-temporally, where are the actions. Um, there's sort of this, you know, prior to our work, there's sort of this dominant paradigm in this world was sort of a dense processing one, where what you would do is you would scan through the video, and either you would do something in a sliding window fashion where you would take this input video, you have an action detector, you would try it at one point in time, slide it over, try it another point in time, slide over, try it another point in time. That's sort of one processing pipeline. Or what you could do is you could do action proposals where you, you know, very much analogous to region proposals and object detection, you could propose, here are some potential places where actions could take place. Why don't I analyze each of those and see if it is a running action, see if it is a, a talking action. So instead we um, did this work that would sort of learn how to watch videos in order to find actions that I care about. And if you, if you think about this, you know, if I'm trying to find something like a baseball swing, and I open up a YouTube video like this one and I see a, a baseball diamond, it, it seems quite likely there's going to be a baseball swing in here. On the, on the contrary, if I open up a, a video and I see someone in a bowling alley, seems very unlikely someone's going to whip out a baseball bat and all of a sudden swing it. I mean, it could happen. These, these things are, you know, it's not necessarily the case it's always going to be happening at Baseball Diamond, but it seems unlikely that that type of action is going to take place in that scene. So when, I, when I, I'm trying to find baseball swings, I should probably look at what I have here and decide whether or not this is even a video worth watching. 
And on the other hand, if I open up this frame, there's really not a whole lot of value in then skipping forward one frame and seeing what the next frame of this video is. Again, there's, there's a lot of correlation between those frames and it's probably not necessary to go scan to the next frame in this video and ask again, is there a baseball swing here? Instead, it would make more sense to sort of jump around this video and find interesting places. So for example, I look at the first frame, I see a baseball diamond, this looks promising. Let me jump ahead a whole bunch. Bunch of people celebrating at home plate, this looks good. Let me back up a little bit, et cetera. Scan around this video to find the places that are likely to find be baseball swings. All right, so we built a model for doing this. So this was sort of, um, you know, learning how to watch videos to, to produce action um, Detect action detections, here's what this model looks like. You basically take a video frame, put it through a CNN to get a representation for what's in that frame, put that into a recurrent neural network that can basically maintain what have I seen so far. This network is going to output a few different things. First of all, it can output a detection hypothesis and say, based on what I've seen so far, I believe that there is a baseball swing detection that happened at this point in time. Now, this model needs to be able to say, ah, I'm not really confident right now, I'm not sure that there actually is a baseball swing. So it can also decide that no, I don't want to trust this output. Don't count this one, don't write it to my canvas up at the top. Say that no, this is not something I trust yet. The other thing this model will output will be, where should I look next? So again, based on everything I've seen so far, I want to jump ahead 26 frames in the video and see what I'm going to find there. Okay. Jump ahead there, it's going to analyze that frame again, put it through a CNN to get some representation for it, put that output into the recurrent neural network that's gonna maintain what, what I've seen so far. And again, I can output those different things. Is there an act, I can output a prospective um, action detection, output whether or not I should trust this thing, where should I look next? And again, I can look here, be confident enough that I've seen enough to say, yes, there's a baseball swing and it took place here, and then carry on, produce another detection. Right, so this sort of, sort of looking around and figuring out where to look next can be more efficient about looking at fewer frames to figure out whether or not there's an action detection or not. So in terms of training this model though, of course, um, some of these things are easier to deal with, some of them are, are harder to deal with. This emission indicator, which says whether or not I trust, this is sort of a hard decision, it's a yes, no. It's not something that's differentiable. Same thing with the next frame to glimpse. It's not something that I can go through and take gradients with respect to. I need to do those via reinforcement learning. All right, so I'm, I think I might sort of, you know, skip ahead a little bit on, on these things. I know Serena was here talking about this before. So basically you can do training of some of these things, like doing the action detections and whether or not those are correct. The visual architecture, those are things that are differentiable. And I can go through and, uh, you know, take gradients with respect to those and figure out where things are. The non-differentiable outputs, you know, where to glimpse next, whether or not to trust this particular output, that's something that we need to train via reinforcement learning. Right? And so we, we use a reinforced algorithm to learn a policy for doing those, those particular actions, whether or not to trust something, where to look next. Basically, you sample a whole bunch of you know, potential sequences, you get rewards for doing those, and decide what happens. Um, the exciting thing to me about this is basically you can get really good quality action detection results, right? So these are sort of measuring average precisions of these action detections at a particular threshold for intersection over union. You can get results that are even better than the previous state-of-the-art models that use comparable sort of architectures while only glimpsing around 2% of the frames in a video. And so to me this is kind of exciting that I don't need to scan through a video in order to figure out where the actions are. I can decide to jump around and figure out where things are. So, so some examples of, of what these policies end up looking like. So which frame should I look at if I'm trying to find whether or not there's a javelin throw in this video? Um, here this is a sequence of frames on the bottom. These are the only ones that the, the method looks at. And at the end of the sequence it outputs a prediction in red. This is where I think a javelin throw took place, which matches well to the ground truth. All right, so here's a video of these sort of learned policies. These are sort of its glimpsing, it says now here, and then back, and I'm, I'm confident. Right. And so it can output a detection hypothesis based upon just sampling those particular frames that it decides are the ones that I, I'd like to see. Right. The other important thing about this method is that it can, can do it at an offset sort of thing. It doesn't have to output a detection instance centered right where it is right now. Right, so it can sort of say this looks like 
the end frame of a hammer throw, or this looks like the, end, the beginning frame of a hammer throw, output a detection that is offset from where I am right now. And again, that's something that's more powerful than the, the regular sort of scanning things that need to sort of analyze this whole chunk. You can build models that basically know what offset I should make for things. I think it's interesting, actions like this, the sort of long jump, it's got a very um, sort of sequential approach to it. So if it looks at a frame, looks at a frame, looks at a frame, it doesn't detect long jump until really right at the end of this. That's when it decided that I'm confident there's a long jump. Probably, you know, there are related actions like a triple jump, where you do sort of hop, skip, and a jump down here. It wants to see the whole sequence, ah, there was no hop, skip, and jump, I've gotten to the end of this, looks like it's a, it's a long jump. All right. Okay. And so, you know, we, we did sort of ablation studies again to check, you know, what are the benefits of these different components of the model. So things such as, you know, deciding when I should output. So if I turn off that indicator variable that lets me say, don't trust this particular detection, the performance drops a lot, which is kind of obvious because you don't want to force this model to always make a prediction. Um, it also matters that you sort of can, you know, not do uniform sampling over the frames. So if I just sampled 2% of the frames uniformly, that would not perform as well as these methods. And again, it's because this method can devote resources to where it matters. It can sort of sample frames near the boundaries of actions rather than just a priori saying, let's uniformly sample all the frames that we, we have. And of course, those two things together is, is even worse. Okay, and, and finally, as I was mentioning, you can do location regression, deciding where should, how long of a, a, an output should I make and what sort of offset should I have. Okay, so that's sort of the, the, the middle park part of the, the talk, talking about sort of temporal structure and uh, you know, reinforcement learning methods to learn how to watch uh, YouTube video type videos to find actions. Does anybody have any questions about that part of the talk? Okay, good, okay. So, the third, third part I want to talk about is um, group structure and some methods that we've done for analyzing um, what a set of people is doing. So um, context is very important in actions. And as a, as a professor, I think in, in the US when you write grant proposals, you have to write sections on broader impacts and, and things like this. In Canada, we have related things. Um, your work has to be important to Canada. Okay, so <laughs> my work is important to Canada because it solves a very important Canadian problem, which is uh, who has the puck? Okay, so um, do you know who has the puck? I guarantee you there are zero puck pixels in this, this image. Um, but you look at it, you can sort of see based on body posture and so forth, um, it's, it's that guy. He's the, he's the one who, who currently has the puck. And we've actually um, built algorithms. This is some older work that we did in 2011 on um, you know, figuring out which of these people has the, the field hockey ball. The, our prediction is the person in pink. And so this is, this is based on sort of hog features and models that sort of look at relative arrangements of people and, and body pose. And basically you can sort of see that everybody's looking sort of in one corner. Though that's a person who likely has the, the ball. Okay, so, so our more recent work in this, this domain has been sort of looking at human trajectories um, to try to analyze um, groups of people and behaviors and figure out what they're doing. So these trajectories are, are, are re real trajectories from um, NBA basketball um, games. You basically have the, the positions of all of the players and the ball for you know, every single possession in the games. We have similar things on, on NHL hockey data as well. And from trajectories like these, I'd like to build models that can analyze them and figure out things such as, um, which team is this? So you saw that, that blue set of trajectories, which NBA team was this? I'd also like to do things such as, you know, which player was that? Um, make predictions, like will this shot be successful? What is the next action that's likely to happen? And so we, we've done work, work toward all of those things and you know, they're, they're serious, you know, the money ball thing is very serious, you know, GMs and coaches, et cetera, use this sort of data. There's all sorts of entertainment applications as well, sports gambling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can, you can make predictions like this. So I'll show at the end of the talk some of our results toward this, but we have methods that basically, just from the trajectories alone, a single possession in an NBA basketball game, we can predict with 25% accuracy which team that was. Uh, just from one possession, right? So we see that, that, that set of trajectories, oh, that was the Golden State Warriors, all right? And um, if, you, if you aggregate those over entire games, you can get really, really high accuracy in terms of which team this was just from seeing the, the motions of the players. They're, they're apparently, they're that distinctive. Okay, so um, that's sort of an example of this in um, uh, um, uh, 
uh, basketball, but we do the same thing in hockey, right? So again, I was mentioning at the beginning of this talk, the state of the art in human detection and so forth is, is really good these days. Um, so are things like doing homography estimation for um, you know, unconstrained, or not quite unconstrained, but broadcast video of sports arenas. So from broadcast um, video of hockey games, you can basically take in that image and figure out where on the rink you're looking at. You can estimate a homography matrix that's, that's basically perfect. Um, I, I have a story to tell about how good it is. So I, worked closely with, I work closely with a company called Sport Logic. They do sports analytics. They're based in Montreal. They work with um, a lot of uh, NHL teams. They're really seriously um, good at this. They have a homography estimation algorithm. It's based on deep learning. Okay. They were running it, and they, they run on all NHL games that take place. They run this, they estimate player positions based on human detections, et cetera, et cetera. And they found that in one hockey arena, their homography estimation was always wrong. Right? They kept saying, you know, the blue lines, I don't know if you know how the blue lines, they were a large amount wrong. So not, not like a couple of inches, but many feet in the wrong position. Keeps giving the wrong answer, wrong answer. So they're like, okay, something wrong with our algorithm, something wrong with our algorithm. Let's call the equipment manager off at that arena, get a tape measure. Can you please measure the distance from the, the red line to the blue lines? So in, in NHL, these are supposed to be prescribed distances. There's no variation allowed. It's supposed to be a certain amount. And they go off there and they measure it, and it's wrong by, you know, four, some, some large number of feet. And it, it's some sort of deflate gate thing. I mean, I mean and if NFL fans know like deflate gate and so forth. Um, this is not sort of widely known. I can't say who it is, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, maybe they were doing that on purpose. Who knows? Um, but th that's how good these algorithms are for estimating homographies. So the older methods would be based on you know, feature points. You say, I know NHL rinks look like this. I detect lines. I detect these circles. I match those. I figure out what it is. Nowadays, what you can do is with, um, you can use that as training data and then use deep networks to basically predict, um, given an arbitrary frame, where are you? And it's very important because um, broadcast video has commercial breaks, they have a lot of camera um, changes. You, you need to be able to reliably, from a frame, estimate the homography, and it's really good. Um, same thing about the player detections. The, the things work quite, quite well. You can then use those in detection by tracking frameworks to get very accurate trajectories of the players in rink coordinates. Um, there are other issues too about players who go out of field of view, etc. You can fill those gaps in using priors on where people appear and disappear. Suffice it to say, you can get really accurate trajectories for where the players are on the ice and over time then figure out things such as, well, I'd like to know that given those trajectories, what's happening in this scene is that, you know, player one has a puck and is passing it to player five while player two is trying to intercept that, uh, that pass. Um, so what we like to do is build models that can analyze these trajectories that we get automatically out of those, those algorithms to then figure out what actions are taking place in these scenes. Okay? And you know, obviously locations matter. These are some examples of the types of events that we try to, to recognize. Um, shots, puck protection events, that's when you sort of, someone tries to take it away from you, you stop them from doing so. Um, passes, dumping it out of zones, et cetera. And th those have sort of, you know, di various distributions in terms of where they would take place over the ice. Those sort of things really do matter. Um, one of the challenges, like I said, we really we can't see the puck. We, we really can't um, with, with the vision algorithms. We, we need to know sort of who, who has the puck, and we, we do sort of methods that will either um, infer that or we will assume that it's, it's given. Okay? And so we can infer that and we'll build representations of all of the other players, usually with respect to the person we believe is currently having the puck. We'll call that sort of the key player. In the basketball context, we actually do have tracking information for the ball. We will again define the key player to be the person who has the ball. We'll try to build representations for the other players with respect to that person. Um, the, the networks that we'll build will come in two different flavors. So one of them will be this so-called share compare trajectory network, and the other one will be a, a, maybe a simpler approach where we just stack trajectories for different players. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what this share compare ne um, trajectory network looks like. Okay, again, the input to this thing is going to be a set of trajectories, x, y coordinates in a world coordinate system that's going to be you know, the NBA arena or the, the um, NHL rink. I'm going to put it through some network and I'm going to use that to do different tasks like classifying what event just took place, classify which team this was, make a prediction about what's going to happen next in the game. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in and talk about what this share compare um, trajectory network is going to look like. Okay, so it's going to be built of a couple of different components. 
So the first thing is there's going to be a thing that's going to analyze each individual trajectory and it's going to have shared parameters. So we're going to learn some parameters that are going to be able to analyze one of these trajectories. We're going to repeat those and apply those to all of the different people that we've seen in this scene. All right? We're then going to combine those together in a sort of a stacking approach that's going to compare every person to the, the key player or the person we believe has the puck or the person we know has the ball. We'll build some type of network that can compare relative sort of motions and um, positions of two different people in this scene. And we'll run those, those through usual sort of column and pooling layers to get a representation for the entire scene, which we can use to classify what's happening in, in that scene. Great. Yeah. Uh, is that rule estimation happening before the shared Yes, yeah, so, so, so the, the who, who is player one is happening before that, and again, it's that sort of application dependent. Sometimes we know who the key player is who has this, this ball or puck, and sometimes we infer that by doing some sort of max type operation outside there. So at this point, we know who that person is. Do you know yeah. any, any rule of the game knowledge, like intercept? Yeah, so I think you, you could build a higher level model on top of this that says these things should happen in sequence, right? So that there shall be a pass before there's an intercept, et cetera. At this point, we do not have that type of um, thing. We're just analyzing each. Yeah, so it's just, it's just going to be supervised. There's going to be supervised learning that we only have these categories. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Question? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So we, we've experimented with a bunch of different v variants of this and exactly. So if you have team membership, you could build models that have, um, you know, features for same team, features for opposing team. Um, and if sometimes you don't have that. So for example, in the NBA data set, we know which team every player is on and so we can build specific things for them. Um, for the version of the NHL data set we were working with, we didn't have that information, so we couldn't. Yeah. But yeah, you, you should be able to do that um, in general. Um, anything else? Okay, so let's look at a little bit more detail what this, this shared trajectory network looks like. So it's going to be basically 1D convolutions, where the, the 1D convolutions are going to operate over the x, y coordinates of the person over time. So, so these are basically x1, y1, that's the position of the player at the first time, x2, y2, that's the position of the player at the second time step, etc. What we're going to do is we're going to learn um, convolutional um, kernels that are going to go over top of this sequence and what they'll correspond to is basically do I have a person who's moving in a straight line? Do I have a person who's making a cut to the left? Do I have a person who's making a cut to the right? The sort of the parameters of these these conv kernels, they're going to tell me what types of patterns I'm looking for. And so as, as you can expect basically we, we run those over top of the, the sequence. We'll have a set of those things with different parameters. They're going to look for those different patterns of motion. And then we can do pooling, right? We can pool those over time to basically say, I don't care exactly when that, that particular pattern happened. And again, we can stack those up as you would with a ConvNet for analyzing images. You could stack up layers of these sort of filtering and pooling operators that analyze the trajectory of one of the people, okay? And so we, we, we learn parameters of those, stack those up on top of each other, and that's how we'll analyze one individual person. Okay, so the, 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 then you can do similar sort of things to the comparison network where basically you're going to do a very similar type of operation except that what you're doing is you're taking in a pair of trajectory features. So I've analyzed the key person with the, with the ball, I've got another person in this same scene, I'm going to have conv uh, filters that are going to analyze what relative positions and motions should there be between those players in order to recognize a particular action. All right, so I'll do that, and again, those parameters can be shared across all the different um, pairs of people. We've also experimented with variants where you have you know, person-specific uh, features. You can sort people by distance to the ball. We've done all sorts of ver versions like that. And then you can concatenate all of those together and then use that for whatever classification task you care about. All right, all right. so, you know, and I'll, I'll sort of just uh, I'm losing my mouse here. Okay, and so we can do the same thing with you know, relative ordering and, and so forth. Okay, so, so let me just jump ahead to the um, experiments. So we, we've, um, we've done experiments in a bunch of different domains, both classification and prediction. Here I'll talk about some things we've done on uh, the Sport Logic, this um, company that does um, hockey data analysis, as well as some things on NBA data set. So for the, the Sport Logic hockey data set, what we're doing is taking in trajectories. We've got six different event classes that we, we care about. Um, for the record, they, they have 
a lot of different interesting events that they, they care about recognizing. So it's interesting to contrast what people think about in the computer vision community around action recognition to what these sort of detailed analysts really want. So I think like a pass, that's really not good enough. Um, they don't want to just know that this was a pass. They want to know that this was a pass that went from defenseman to defenseman. They want to know this is a pass that went from defenseman to defenseman that went um, north-south, which means up and down the ice, not east-west across the ice. They want to know there was a north-south pass that was successful. They want to know there was a north-south pass that was successful that went along the ice and not in the air. They want to know there was a north-south pass that went along the ice, was successful, went off the boards indirectly to get to the person. So if you talk about subcategory recognition, there is sort of, you know, thousands of events types that, that happen in these. And same thing with soccer analytics, the people who, who actually you know, gather the data about what the players are doing. It's at a very, very fine-grained level of detail. And it's sort of exciting to work on as a computer vision person. For the purpose of this, so we're just using these sort of six very broad um, event classes. And we're using the share compare trajectory network to basically take in those trajectories of the players and figure out what happened. OK. So, this was the, the version of the, the trajectories that we were using at this point. Since then, they've been cleaned up quite a bit. You basically have trajectories for the different players. Some of them are partial as the people go in and out of field of view, and the tracker sometimes has some missteps. Um, the, the details on how we're setting this up, we've got an you know, automated homography estimation to get the trajectories um, nailed down to rink coordinates. Rather, relatively short 16 frame long segments with five people maximum extracted from the, um, the people that we can see. We zero pad if there are fewer than five people in the scene. Um, this shows sort of the distribution. It's unbalanced sort of thing. Passes are by far the most frequent thing. We're using two, four full games of, of NHL data for training, two for validation, and, and two for test in this scenario. All right. So, you know, we also experiment both with, you know, known key players as well as when we do a sort of a max over different possible key players to try to figure out who has the puck in these scenarios. Okay, so here are some um, results we compare to a few different uh, baseline methods. We're reporting average precisions for these different events as well as mean APs down here. Um, improved dense trajectories, so this is an older method for sort of um, doing um, uh, action recognition. Improved dense trajectories has a trajectory feature in it. They, I mean, they also have these uh, visual features, but you can also just strip out the, the trajectory feature, which is basically a hard-coded method for um, tracking how a feature point evolves over time. That's one of the baselines we used. We also compared to sort of visual methods, so things like C3D and fine-tune C3D on this, these tasks. Um, our method does not use the actual um, pixels once we've gone to the trajectory representation. Um, you know, you could go back and take a look at actually what the appearance of the person is to figure out what they're doing, but in this case, we're doing it purely based on the, the trajectories. Okay, so. We can sort of outperform C3D type of methods that are going back and looking at things. Um, the performance is also sort of complementary. We're better on different um, categories than they are. Okay. So I mentioned the sort of the, um, the NBA data set and, uh, you know, analyzing teams. So just as an example of what this looks like, we have um, uh, 30 different NBA teams. So we have a, a, a data set that has basically all the games for an entire uh, year, an entire season of, of NBA. Again, this is the sort of thing it looks like. It's relatively clean in terms of the, the trajectories that you get out. These are from multi-camera systems that are installed in NBA arenas. So just as a sort of a proxy for what can we do with these data, we decide, as I was saying, to say, can we classify the different teams? So there are 30 different NBA teams, pretty even in terms of the number of possessions that we have for each of these teams. So this is just sort of one sequence that ends in a shot being taken. Um, chance performance is basically 3% at this task because you have know, 30 teams uh, that you could, you could choose from. Uh, we train up this model using you know, 82,000 possessions for training and a bunch of um, ones for testing that are from different games that we uh, hadn't seen before. Okay, so, so the, sort of the end result, I, you know, we explore a lot of different architectures for trying to classify one possession. What was that that happened in that, or wh which team was that? And if we just do some very simple aggregation, so we basically classify each, trajectory, each set of trajectories in a possession as which team was that, and we just do a majority voting over an entire game, we can get 95% you know, accuracy in terms of which team was this. And so it's quite interesting. We've done other follow-on work where we did things like predicting where the next shot is going to take place. So in an NBA game, apparently, you know, right under the basket, that's the most frequent place for a shot to take place. 
If you want to predict where the next shot is going to take place, you should probably either say right under the basket or where the ball is right now. Those are kind of the two good places to, to predict. Um, we have models that can do better than that. They can kind of interpolate between those two and make some predictions based on what everybody else is doing in terms of where, where the ball, um, where it should take place. Okay, so that's sort of um, uh, the summary of this, this third part about you know, learning trajectory representations for group activity. To me, the interesting thing is we, we have ways to analyze trajectories of people. And I think this is useful, you know, the sports context is, is fun to work on, but the same thing is true in surveillance videos as well. If you analyze patterns of motion and you look at where people have been, you can tell the difference between different types of behavior. You know, two people walking together, people separating, coming together to meet, to talk. Those sort of, um, you know, analyzing how they've moved through a space is really important for action recognition. Okay, so I wanted to throw in sort of a, an appendix which is kind of, uh, I think, totally unrelated to the things I just talked about, but I, I, I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about it and you know, I, I'm very happy to ha hear any feedback. Um, we recently done some work on uh, sort of a new, new version of the, the visual question answering or VQA uh, uh, problem. So, um, you know, traditional VQA systems uh, work on uh, the following task. Given an image, answer a question about the image. Okay, that's sort of the, the paradigm you work in. Here's an image, here's a question about that image, tell me the answer. Um, there are other problems with it about, you know, the data sets that are, are created for that have a lot of strange biases in them, right? You know, like asking, you know, how many bananas make the mustache is sort of a strange thing to be asking in general. So. We said, well, let's take a different tack on this. I mean, what, what, what should um, visual question answering really be doing? Well, how about the following? Um, given a question that someone actually cares about, um, answer this question by looking for clues in images, plural, about this thing. Okay, so what we did is we went out to um, travel recommendation websites and scraped a bunch of questions that, that real people ask about real places in the world. Okay, so there are things like this. What do people ask? They ask things like, um, is the boardwalk accessible to wheelchair? That particular boardwalk, we can go off to Google image search, get back 100 images of that place. Let's see if we can use those images to answer that particular question. Um, another thing people ask, they're at some you know, wildlife preserve, can I hold a koala? People really ask that. Um, can I hold a koala? Go back, get 100 images of that place. Let's see if we can answer that question, can I hold a koala? Okay, so um, we did this. We collected raw data from several tra travel recommender websites. Um, we got you know, 53,000 questions and answers, um, again, plural answers, collected from 5,000 different unique places across five categories. Um, we basically chose categories where there were large numbers of questions were asked. Um, the categories are you know, hotels, museums, restaurants, nightlife venues, places for outdoor activities. Um, so some more examples of the types of things that people ask in the image area. So question, you know, I saw dogs are allowed on the deck, are they also allowed on the beach? A whole bunch of images of this particular um, probably beach hotel resort. Um, here's a restaurant, is a jacket required for men? A bunch of images of people dining in that restaurant. So the interesting thing is you know, the, the ground truth answers are also sometimes complex. So the ground truth answers for the first one were, answer one was we only allow dogs on the deck, on the deck only. Answer two, sorry, they are allowed in, on the beaches. There are, however, beach, they're not allowed on the beaches. There are, however, beaches where you can take your dogs. Um, so you know, people often provide more information than is necessary. Um, more example of this, you know, here's a, another place I could go. I am on crutches, will it be a problem? Okay, so it's a very mountainous sort of place. In answers like, we went up by the normal wooden steps, wide and not too steep for easy hike to the mountain by foot with our tour guide from China highlights. Absolutely nothing to do with whether or not the person can do it. Answer number two is not a good idea, I would say. Okay, so, so what we did, you know, we took all these things, you know, more examples like, I would like to have rooms with a sea view, do you have such rooms in the hotel? So people ask hard questions, okay? They don't really ask easy questions like, you know, how many bananas make the mustache? They ask <laughs> things that are actually difficult. And then when they answer them, um, not all of them have uh, binary answers, okay? But what we do is we'll filter the data set down to only those two types. So we, we throw out questions that are basically um, not visually answerable. So sometimes people ask things like, what time does the museum close? 
And while maybe there's a picture of the sign that says opening hours, there, there likely is not. I think there's a much broader interest. There is a whole, you know, question answering is a task in and of itself. And I think that more broadly pushing in that direction would be really interesting. You know, you could go off and get other types of data to help answer those, those questions. Right, so you know, question, my, my husband loves Italian food but not pizza. Is there anything else on the menu? Lots of pictures of food at this restaurant. Um, do you have kitchenette in the rooms? pictures and some of them have, have questions. So what we did was we, we went through all these um, questions, we filtered them to make sure that they're visually answerable. We also filtered the questions to make sure that they have a sort of a single query. Sometimes people ask, you know, long things that have many questions embedded in them just for simplicity. You could go back and break those apart into the different questions. Um, so, you know, things like, you know, hi, do the individual rooms in this hotel have a safe where you can keep your valuables in? Yes, we keep that question. What time is the bar open? No, we don't keep that question. We don't think that's going to be visually answerable. Um, as I was mentioning before, people ask or, or respond with really helpful, long-winded things. You know, someone asks, is there parking? And people write, you know, a paragraph about, you know, overnight parking and pricing and things nearby and, you know, what we tend to do and what we like. We just say, yes, yes, there is parking. <laughs> that's all we're trying to predict. Again, I think it would be really interesting to try to build a, um, a generation method that would actually generate stuff like this. So not just a yes, no, but you could, you could train up something that would actually generate um, answers that were you know, more interesting than just the binary thing that we do. So, so in, in the end, so we have you know, about 5,500 visually answerable questions that have a single query that come from 2,500 different distinct places. We have about 230,000 images that correspond to those places, um, you know, 97 images for each place on average. And so the final, you know, sort of how hard is this data set? Yes is the most common answer, but it's only serving you know, as 65.6% as a yes. Um, Another thing we did was we said, well, how good are people at doing this? So we, we gave human evaluators questions from this data set, a subset of them, we didn't do the, the whole thing exhaustively, we gave them the images that you have and asked, you know, how well can you answer these questions? In this subset that we did, it was sort of 76.6%. Again, it's kind of a hard task. There are, are things that require external knowledge. I don't claim that all of it's going to be visually in these, these images. And again, people ask things that are difficult to answer. That's why they're asking them. It's not necessarily a clear sort of thing. Um, we ran a bunch of different algorithms as well. So another problem with VQA datasets is that often, um, if you ignore the images, you can do quite well. So this data set seems not to have that type of bias. If you just use the question features, either via bag of words or LSTM embeddings, you get results that are pretty close to that baseline, just guess yes. Um, we've, we've played around with uh, various adaptations of state-of-the-art methods for VQA, adapted to the setting where you have a set of images that go in, which is different from the, the traditional one image, one question, and we can get something that's in between, so you know, 70% uh, performance by doing um, questions plus images. So I, I hope we'll be releasing this soon. We've got to sort of clean up the data set and so forth, but I'd be very happy to talk with people more about, about what we've done. Um, so I just want to conclude by saying, you know, Thanks very much for listening and thank you to my students. They're the ones who did all this work that I, I get to come here and talk about. So thanks very much. Watch the trajectories and we predict the team. Right. Uh, however, the other teams know yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so no, no one cares predicting which team it is, for yes. the record. Yeah, yeah. Can yeah. you go yeah. and explain why is this team? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we've, we've done things about you know analyzing which plays are most indicative of this particular team. Um, like people who know basketball, there's a play called a pick and pop that some team runs. We find these. So we've done that as well. And also, it's a good proxy for things you might actually care about. So um, the, the predictive thing, I think, is much more interesting. Predict what's going to happen next. Yeah. OK, so people are kind of leaving on last. Does anybody want to make an uh, announcement about the PSR? I don't know. There's a PSR next door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's, that's it. <laughs> so yeah, let's thank Greg again for coming. All right, thanks.